Can be. All right, so we're going to everybody to quiet down and we're going to go on the record now. I'm just going to go ahead and make the exception now. Um, one night to three through two or seven. And these are photographs from the sales. These are the physical items that we filed the motion to suppress on. Okay. All right. So you preserved your right. objection. Great. I appreciate you doing that. Do you know which one? Yeah, I'll pull our last my record is 158 and we have 158, so we need to change that one. And Damien, are you confident that's our situation? I got it. Alright. It's no problem. Why don't we wait until we sure which one needs to be and we'll do it uh, at a later time when Damien has a chance to call through this. It's a lot of stuff. Other than that, who is the next witness? Um, detective Householder. Detective Householder. Detective Householder. If you could get the detective and sit. Okay, let's get him or her right there. Barbados. He sent me a picture in front of Rihanna's house. He was very excited. <laughs> it hasn't been done yet? And who has it?
Is that the detective in the front row? Yes, sir. How are you? I'm terrific. Uh, just slide on down, Christy. If you just slide over, take that seat in the very first row there so you can get right out of there. And in a second, I'm going to have you meet the deputy up here at the front. Perfect. And uh, when you come up, watch your step. We have plugs everywhere. When you get around the screen, you're going to face the clerk and you're going to raise your right hand and be sworn in. When you take the stand, do me a favor. Speak directly into the center of the microphone. It doesn't work from the sides. Grab it. The whole base moves. It's flexible, but get it close by. Okay? I don't have to tell you that again now. Miss Mixon, can you proceed while they're doing the firearm? Do we have another deputy you can bring? Yes, we do. Can we bring out the, is it time to bring out the jury, guys? Okay, let's bring in the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, jury of Detective, come on up. All right. Okay. You follow his instructions. Yeah. Well. Terrific. Now. You would state your full name for the record and spell it for us slowly. Stephanie Householder, S-T-E-F-A-N-Y. My last name, Householder, H-O-U-S-E-H-O-L-D-E-R. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Detective Householder, how are you currently employed? With the Sheriff's Office in the Homicide Unit. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Department? Four and a half years. Can you tell us about your education and training that you've had thus far? Uh, after high school, I went to Florida State University for criminal justice, and then I went to the police academy, did my time, the allotted hours that I needed to complete, and then I went to, uh, got hired with the sheriff's office and completed in-house training. When you were assigned or when you got hired by the sheriff's department, uh, were you working road patrol? Yes. Was there a particular part of the county that you worked when you initially started? The north region of the county. So what? Every, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Everything of uh, Belvedere to the Martin County line. Okay. Um, and how long, you said detective, how long have you been a detective? Since September of 2018. Okay. I want to talk to you about road patrol work you did back in February of 2017. Okay. I know you said you worked Belvedere North, right? Yes. Okay. February 5th, 2017, was there a specific area that you were assigned to that you were patrolling? I was assigned to respond to calls anything north of Blue Heron. Okay. And on February 5th, 2017, Super Bowl Sunday, that night, did you respond to a call on the north end of the county? Yes, I did. And was that in Jupiter? Yes. And within the city of Jupiter, are there pockets that are actually patrolled by the sheriff's department because it's the county? It's yes, unincorporated. Unincorporated. Yes. Okay. And that call that you responded to, was that completely unrelated to the case that we're here on today? Yes. When you responded to that call, uh, were there other deputies that responded with you? Yes. Who were those deputies? Deputy Radka and Deputy Sanders. Once you respond to that call, let me ask you this, about what time was it? Around 10 o'clock at night. Okay. And after you cleared that scene at that call, uh, did you, Deputy Racka and Deputy Sanders? Yes. Did you all all leave at the same time? Yes. And were you all somewhat, not necessarily following each other, but headed in the same direction? Yes. And did there come a point when you were leaving that call um, that one of your fellow officers was almost struck by another car. Yes. Okay, so tell us which way you were heading and what happened. We were going north on alternate A1A, going through the intersection at Tony Penna. And what happens as, do you have the green light? Yes. 
And how is it that you and the other two patrol cars, the other deputies are traveling? Are you side by side following each other? The Deputy Racco was in front of me. I was in the middle and then Deputy Stander, Sanders was behind me all traveling in the same lane. Okay. And what direction did you say you were traveling in? North. You're traveling north. And what happens? A black four-door sedan runs a red light going eastbound on Tony Pena, turning left on to north alternate A1A. And when you say, what happens when they run the red light? They almost uh, collide with Deputy Racco who was driving in front of me. How is it that the collision was avoided? The car made a sharp turn, a sharp left turn to go north on alternate A1A. At this point, what does Deputy Racco do? Deputy Racco continues driving north. What do you and Deputy Sanders do? We, get, we attempt to get behind the car that just ran the red light for the traffic infraction. Okay, how does that go? He, or an, the unknown driver, because I couldn't see in the car, got into a turn lane to go back south on alternate A1A, and we weren't able to get directly behind him at that time. Okay, I wanna pause for just a second. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, do you know anything about what has taken place um, on Mohawk Street in Jupiter? No. Okay, and if a call went out over the radio about this shooting um, in the city of Jupiter, would it have come out on your radio? No. And why not? We don't share the same um, radio channels. Okay. And knowing that this was Super Bowl Sunday, um, would you consider the driving that you had seen of this dark color, was it a four-door sedan? Yes. The driving that you had seen exhibited by this four-door sedan, uh, would you classify it as kind of erratic or reckless? Yes, I thought it was gonna be a DUI driver. Okay. Uh, at this point, did you activate your lights? No. As a part of, well, were you a DUI traffic officer at that time? No. Are you familiar with some of the practices that have to be followed um, leading up to initiating a, a DUI investigation? Yes, it is taught to us. Okay, and as a part of a DUI investigation, uh, is it important to observe potentially a driving pattern to see if the driver is potentially under the influence? Yes. So at this time, you believe it's potentially going to be someone driving under the influence? Yes. And were you attempting to, in addition to what you've already seen, establish a driving pattern? Yes. Okay, so you proceed to attempt to follow this car? Yes. Okay, so what happens? The driver or the vehicle makes a U-turn to go south on alternate A1A in front of oncoming traffic, which prevented me and Deputy Sanders from making the U-turn. We waited until traffic cleared. We made the U-turn after the car. So I saw the car turn right onto Tony Pena to travel westbound. Did you see the car's turns as you were still waiting to make a U-turn or after you had made a U-turn, if you recall? I don't recall. Okay, but you were able to see that they turned on a turn, Tony Pena? Yes. So once you and Deputy Sanders successfully make a U-turn, mm -hmm. what happens? I then, we travel south on alternate A1A, making a right at Tony Pena, and at that point, the car was ahead of us, so I could only see the taillights, and I saw the the taillights of the vehicle turn left onto military trail. You saw the, the taillights? taillights? Yes. Okay, and did you know that this was the same vehicle that had almost hit Deputy Ratka and made the U-turn into oncoming traffic? I believed it to be, yes. Okay, and what happens when you see, well, where was it, do you know the street that you saw the vehicle on? Do you, like Tony Pena? It was on Tony Pena? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you do once you see the car? Well, I saw the car turn from Tony Pena onto military trail, okay. turn that left turn. At that point, I made a left turn as well onto military trail, and I saw the same, what I perceived to be the same taillights, turn right onto a street. I don't recall the name. And is this now, are we in the city of Jupiter? Yes. Okay, and that's not an area that you patrol? Correct. Okay. So this car makes a turn, and what do you do? I'm, I make the turn where the car made the turn. Okay, and what do you see? At that point, I lost sight of the car. Do you continue to try to locate the car? Yes, I made another right turn into a neighborhood. I believe it was Pennock Street mm -hmm. or Lane, and then I saw the a car with the same 
tail lights run a stop sign ahead of me. So then I proceed to follow. And at that point, the car made another left turn onto another side street in a neighborhood. Did you believe this to be the same car? Yes. That you initially saw that almost hit Deputy Ratka? Yes. Okay, so what happens when you, do you pull up behind this car? Do you turn on that same street that the car is on? I did, and I saw um, brake lights parallel parked on the side of a street near a, um, near a park or an open area. And that's when I made a right turn and pulled behind the vehicle. What happens when you pull behind? Well, let me ask you this. When you pull behind the vehicle, are you able to see anyone inside? No. Okay. What happens when you, you said the vehicle was partially parked or parked? You parallel parked parallel along parked. the curb. Yes. Okay. And was the car still parked when you turned onto that street? Yes. Does the car stay parked? For a few seconds, yes. And then what does the car do? The rear driver's side door opens and a male falls out of the back seat. At that point, the car makes, goes straight a little bit, drives away, making a right turn. And then at that point, I couldn't follow the car anymore. Now, the entire time that you're attempting to locate this car that you saw, um, is Deputy Sanders still following you? Yes. Um, when you see this person fall out of the car, well, do you know whether they got out of the car on their own and kind of fell out or they were pushed out of the car? I couldn't see anyone else inside the car. Okay. When the car takes off, does anyone pursue the other car? Deputy Sanders. Okay, and what do you do? I stay with the male that is currently on the ground. Can you describe for us uh, what that male was wearing? I believe it was a red t-shirt and dark colored shorts. Can you describe what position he was in on the ground? He was in somewhat of a, what I would describe a fetal position. Did you immediately go over to him and render any type of aid? Yes. Okay. Did you ask him any questions? I asked him what happened at that. What From looking at him, could you see that he has sustained some type of injuries, regardless as to how he got them, that he has sustained some type of injuries? Yes, he had um, an injury to his groin area. Was there blood? Yes. Okay. So you said that you did ask him questions. Yes. As a part of, well, let me back up just a second. At this point, do you know anything about what the shooting that's happened on Mohawk? No. Okay. And so you have no idea whether he's a suspect, victim, what has happened to him? I have no idea. Okay. And as a part of you rendering aid to someone who is visibly injured, do you inquire of them to try to get information as to what happened to them? Yes. Okay. So what did you ask him? I asked him what happened, and his response was... Overall. You can answer. Uh, his response was, they shot me. Did you ask him who? Yes, and he said, I don't know, I blacked out. Did you ask him any questions about where he was at that he got shot? I did, I asked him where did it happen, and he said, I was at my buddy's house near Jupiter Christian. Okay. Because you knew he was injured, did you call for fire rescue? Yes, I did. And did fire rescue come out to yes. that scene? Yes. Uh, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing the witness, uh, what's been marked and shown to defense as states exhibits 193 through 202. And from the witness. Of course. Second counsel, if you could take a look at these exhibits um, for me and let me know if you recognize these photographs. Yes. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Are these photos a fair and accurate representation of the location you responded to in the Paseos neighborhood where you saw um, a male fall out of a car and that you rendered aid to? Yes. Okay, at this time the state would offer into evidence states exhibit 193 through 202. 193 through 202. 
197 we've already covered. Okay, that's not what they told me. Okay. So we'll take a look at that later to keep okay. things moving. Uh, any objections to these photographs other than previously articulated? All right. So same ruling, and then we'll get our, our numbers straight. Just so I'm clear, you said which numbers were taken, 193 through? Through 197. Through 197. Okay. I can see it. Okay. And is this the scene where you followed the car to and there was a male who found Lane in the street? Yes. Okay. And at some point, once you called for fire rescue, was um, was Jupiter Police Department called as well? Yes. And did you stay on scene? Yes. Okay. I just want to go back for just a second. Do you recall the exact time that you saw, first saw the car, I back do. when you were leaving the first call? I do not. Okay. Uh, do you have an idea approximately what time? It wasn't too long after the call, around 1030. Okay. Okay. Are you familiar with the area I know that you said you work in pockets, but are you familiar with the area to know where Jupiter Christian is located? I do not know where it's located. Okay. Now, as you're speaking with this male, do you later learn what his name is? Yes. Okay, and what was his name? Would your report refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. Okay, and we'll come back to that. So once fire rescue gets to the scene, uh, did Jupiter Police Department arrive at the same time or did they come subsequent to fire rescue? I believe Jupiter PD came after fire rescue. Yes. Okay, and going back to the name of the individual that was laying in the street, yes. uh, would your report refresh your recollection? Yes. And approach the witness, Your Honor? Christopher Basta? Basta? Vasada? Yes. Okay. Now, once fire rescue arrives and they began to render him aid, let me ask you this about his clothing. Mm -hmm. um, you said he had on a red, he was wearing a red shirt, dark colored pants. Yes. Uh, were all of his clothes still on his body, like shorts pulled up, shirt on? I believe his shorts were pulled down a little bit. Okay. Was that something that you had done? No. Okay, and did you touch him at all before fire rescue got there? I believe I gave him either a towel or a paper towel that I would have handed to him and told him to apply pressure, but I don't believe I gave or I touched him. Okay. Now there comes a point where although he, well, let me ask you this, did he identify himself to you? Yes. Did there come a point that you attempted to verify his identity? Yes. How did you go about doing that? I attempted to look for a driver's license or an ID card. Where did you look for that? His pockets. And did you just go up to him and go in his pockets? He was being loaded onto the fire, the EMS rig, and I, I believe I did, yes. And what happens when you go inside of his pocket? I feel what I know to be a, a magazine to a firearm and a loose bullet. Did you ask him anything? Um, may I have just a moment, Your Honor?
So when you when you found the magazine, were there bullets in the magazine? I don't recall. Okay. But you said there was a loose bullet in the pocket as well. Yes. And when you saw the magazine and the bullet, did you ask him where the gun was? Yes, I did. What was his response to you? His response was, I was at my buddy's house. Okay. Was he able to, is that all he was able to tell you? Yes. Okay. I want to show you a picture. <clears throat> well, let me ask you this. Once he was taken by fire rescue, were there any items belonging to him that were left at uh, the Paseo's neighborhood? The shorts that he was wearing, the magazine and the loose bullet is what I can remember. And did you touch those items or pick those items up? Yes. Okay. Um, did you alert Jupiter Police Department once they arrived of the items? Yes. And did you tell them what? Were these items that were laying in the street from where Christopher Lasada was? Yes. Okay. So when Jupiter Police Department arrives, do you alert them to kind of everything that it transpired, how it is that you got to this particular neighborhood? Yes. Okay, so I want to show you a map. I want to go back to the direction. Um, Can I have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever go to, well, once Jupiter Police Department arrived on scene, um, did you then learn about a shooting happening? Yes. Okay. And did you stay on, how long did you stay on scene at this Paseos neighborhood? I believe I stayed until Jupiter PD left the area. Did you ever go to Mohawk Street? No. And I asked you earlier about the approximate time that you left the call that actually had you in the area. Yes. Um, would that be indicated in your report? Mm, I don't believe. Uh, yes. Okay. It would, would have been would, the time would that you I. In your report, refresh your recollection as to the approximate time? Yes. Okay, if you could take a look at that and let me know. This is around 10 40 okay. p.m. And I just want to go back to the directions, uh, Detective Householder. You said that when you left the first call, you were on A1A? Yes. Okay, and you A1A runs in what directions? North and south. Okay, it runs north and south. Yes. And the car that was almost hit, Deputy Racta, was traveling in what direction? Eastbound. Traveling eastbound. Yes. And kept traveling eastbound and then you began traveling eastbound as well? No. He was traveling eastbound until he made a left to go north on alternate. Okay. Okay. And then you followed? Yes. And then the car made a U-turn? Yes. To then travel? Southbound. South? Yes. And then they made a turn to go? West. West. Okay. Were you ever certain of the make and model of the car? No. Were you able to get the tag number when the car was parallel parked in the Paseos neighborhood? No. And I may have asked you this, did uh, Deputy Sanders attempt to go after the car? Yes. Okay, and was Deputy Sanders unsuccessful at that? In yes. locating the car? Yes.
while you were at the scene at, in the Paseos neighborhood, was crime scene tape put up around the area that you indicated um, the male, Chris Posada, was found laying? I did not put up crime scene tape. But was the scene secured? Yes. Okay. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes. <clears throat> questions detective householder as far as the items that were located in his pocket the magazine and the bullet um, you said you did touch those yes okay and where did you put them I mean did you touch them when you took them out of his pocket yes and where did you put them on the ground did you put them with his other thing yes and then you know notified Jupiter Police Department of the items that were in the street and what you recovered off of him yes no further question cross it's all right. You, you need to ask another question? I'll do it. Um, yes, no? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, you do? Did you find um, a glove of any sort in the pocket of Christopher Basada, or was it just the magazine and the bullet? All I can recall is the magazine and the bullet. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we got a numbering issue, I think, right? And it's important for us. So jurors, I don't want you to sit here while we talk out loud. Um, so I'm gonna have you go into the jury room. I'm slightly compulsive about this. And here's, so you know, <clears throat> this lady right here is typing every single thing that happens in here. And all these things have to match up. So somebody wants to review what I've done, Say, hey, Marks is good or did, did it bad. And if we don't have everything right in order, uh, that's a problem for me. So I'm going to ask, the, and, and listen, we've made our way through 200 and, and both sides have, have done an excellent job. So um, give me a minute. Turn your pads upside down. Don't talk about the case. Go on into the jury room, grab some coffee, whatever. You can bring it out to your seat with you if you'd like, and I'll be right with you. And then lawyers, come on up to Damien and uh, bring your stuff with you, whatever it needs to be done, and, and we'll get it figured out. And Mr. Pribble, or Ms. Ramsey, or both? Come up there too. Let, let's make sure everybody's on the same page. And uh, one time Damien was wrong. One time. So Damien, take a look and uh, help us out. And it can be, we're off the record right now. Can we hold it for a sec? Sure. Just hold it for a Help them. And then I'll be right back and we'll go on the record.
Okay, so I'm getting a nod from Damien that our numbers and our photographs are all straight. Am I correct? Is there anything we need to state on the record? Can you do that for me? Everybody's on the same page. Great. Thank you, guys. Now, Mr. Oh, Miss Mixon. I just wanted to show the something. Show, show, show them. No, no, no. <laughs> So, Mr. Cripple wanted to bring something up, though, on the record. Okay. I just wanted to make it more clear. We would need our objection regarding the motion to suppress the human body of three people. So, we certainly subject to the time and state of this particular statement to the other side of the day. But only the house rules are understanding that my initial. Can we just have tweaking it? I don't know what it is. It's the courtroom. It's the courtroom. Yeah. yeah. We can't okay. hear it. I was just making sure it was abundantly clear on the record that our renewal of the objection to the introduction of statements made by Mr. Basada, even though only made at the first time the state of listed of those statements, that that objection was to each of those statements. And in respecting your honor's ruling, we felt that, in fact, had preserved that issue. I appreciate it, and yes, you got it. And I think we're about to go to cross. Am I correct? Well, I'm going to ask another question. There's a portion of the video I want to show and I have it marked. Okay. But what? with the understanding that the disc is going to come over because it was a malfunctioning, but I have it on my computer. So you've seen it. Board. I've seen it. I don't have an objection to it. And I'm fine if the state wants to continue their direct and order. Thank you very much. Can we bring them out? Yes. You're, you're what, you're working on something there. It's the printer. It's my printer. I couldn't get the power on. You said when you asked to disconnect? It disconnected. Oh, is this for the printer? Yeah. Oh, that's smart. Thanks. I called them. I forgot. Thank you so much. I just. 
just need you guys to be at my house when all these things go wrong. I just unplug everything. Fixing, you ready for me to bring them out? Okay, I don't. No, no, no. Take care of it. No problem at all. For whatever it's worth, we are moving quicker than we thought. Much I quicker. Stuff. I had a feeling. Sixty-one through one seventy-six, but no objection. Hereby admitted. Bring the jury. Jury entering. All right, jurors, thank you for your patience. We got the numbers all straight. And just so you know, when you get those photographs back in the jury room with you, attached to the back of them are cards that have the numbers on there. So you can see in your notepads, whatever. So they'll, uh, they'll be there for you. And state, uh, I think, has de and everybody can have a seat. State has determined they got a couple more questions for the detective. So state when you're ready. Um, Detective Household, may I approach the witness, Ron? You may. Showing the witness what will be marked for ID number 95. And I told the other lawyers while you were busy doing something else, you don't have to ask me anymore. You guys have all been so polite across the board. Just come on up. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, Detective Householder, I want to show you a clip. Um, and you let me know if you recognize the area um, and the, the time, date, what happened at this intersection. Okay. I do recognize the area. Yes. Okay. And what you were just shown, is that a 
fair representation of the night that you were on Via Zamora and in the Paseos neighborhood when you observed the four door dark colored sedan um, that parallel parked and then pulled off and someone fell out of the back seat? Yes. Okay. No further questions at this time. Now, cross examination. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, at the time that this happened, you were working road patrol, right? Yes. So that's, uh, you're wearing a, a sheriff's office uniform and driving a sheriff's office vehicle that we've all seen that says Palm Beach Sheriff's Office on it, right? Yes. It's got the green and yellow markings and uh, the lights on top, Yes. Right? Um, the vehicle you were driving was equipped with a, a dash camera. Yes. And uh, those are designed for uh, a deputy to be able to record uh, things that are happening in front of the vehicle and it's something that you can activate just like you could activate your lights and sirens, correct? Yes. And in this particular case, I think you said that at the time that you came behind that vehicle in Paseos when when Christopher Basada came out of that car, um, you didn't have your lights and sirens activated. Correct. And so your dash camera wasn't on. Correct. Um, one of the other units that was there, Deputy Sanders, his dash camera was on. I don't know. Well, you remember giving a deposition in this case. Yes. Right? You remember I was there, Mr. Ramsey was there? Yes. Okay. Do you remember we showed you the dash cam? Honestly, I don't remember. Fine. Okay. <clears throat> and if your car had recorded, you would have had the ability to, to make sure that the recording was uploaded to the sheriff's office server and kept as part of evidence related to the case number for this case, right? Correct. Um, and just like Deputy Sanders, if his dash camera was recording, he would have had the same ability to do so, right? Correct. <clears throat> now, you talked a lot about when you first came into contact with this vehicle that you suspected was an impaired driver, right? Yes. And that uh, you and Deputy Sanders sort of pursue that vehicle while Deputy Rocca continued in the direction he was traveling. I believe he did, yes. And during the course of uh, following that vehicle, you lost sight of that vehicle. Yes. <clears throat> and you were able to find uh, another vehicle with the same taillights. I believed, sometime, yes. Sometime after that, correct? Yes. And uh, do you know about how much time elapsed between losing sight initially and when you eventually regained sight of that vehicle? It was only a couple minutes. Okay. And during those couple minutes, obviously, uh, you didn't see where that car went, right? Correct. You don't know if that car stopped anywhere, right? Correct. <clears throat> and during the course, before you lost sight of it, when you were following that vehicle, you didn't see anything thrown out of that vehicle, right? No. Um, didn't see any articles of clothing or masks or anything thrown out of that vehicle, correct? No. In light of what you eventually learned that vehicle was connected to, if you had seen that, you would have brought that to the attention of the Jupiter Police Department who was investigating a triple homicide, correct? Yes. <clears throat> now, during the times that you were initially following that vehicle and the time when you eventually sort of stopped behind that vehicle, uh, you weren't able to see the occupants inside the vehicle, correct? No, I was not. So you weren't able to get a visual on the driver of the vehicle? Correct. And obviously Mr. Vasada came out of the back of the vehicle, so he wasn't driving that car, correct? Correct. Uh, you weren't able to see um, anyone in the front passenger seat of that vehicle? No. Uh, you weren't able to see anyone in the rear right passenger seat of that vehicle, correct? Correct. <clears throat> now, you described how uh, Mr. Basada fell out of the left rear passenger side of that vehicle. Yes. And I think the state asked you, you're not sure if he fell out or if he was pushed out by another individual. Correct. And you didn't... Uh, see Mr. Vasada actually with his hand opening the door as he came out of the vehicle? I did not. And when he did come out of the vehicle onto the street, uh, he wasn't moving, right? Correct. He didn't try to get up and, and walk away or run away? No. Uh, in fact, he was seriously injured? Yes. Um, to the extent that you called the 
paramedics to come, right? Yes. And they eventually took him away for urgent medical care. Yes. <clears throat> now, during your interactions with Mr. Basada, you talked about some statements that he made. Um, you also talked about how you were attempting to identify who he was and were uh, looking for identification in his pockets, correct? Yes. And during the course of that, you found in the pocket of his shorts a, a magazine for a firearm, right? Yes. And a, a loose bullet. Yes. And those are both things that, as a law enforcement officer, you are uh, very experienced and familiar with, correct? Yes. The state asked you about a glove. Yes. And uh, you didn't find the glove in his pocket. I don't recall finding one, no. And you wrote a uh, report in this case. Yes. Pretty detailed, based on the gravity of the case, right? Yes. And so you noted specifically that the magazine and the stray bullet did, in fact, come out of the pocket. Yes. Correct? Um, your report, you didn't note that the glove was found in the pocket, correct? Correct. And it was found on the street there? Correct. And you didn't have any additional involvement in collecting or processing that evidence, right? No. <clears throat> when you stopped um, and Deputy Sanders continued in pursuit of the vehicle after Mr. Basada came out of the vehicle, um, Mr. Deputy Sanders never actually caught that vehicle, for no. lack of a better word, right? Correct. Now, the magazine that was found in, in Mr. Vasada's pocket, that's a magazine that would go to a semi-automatic firearm, correct? Yes. As opposed to like a revolver. Correct. Um, and I assume that you yourself, as a law enforcement officer, carry a service weapon. Yes, I do. And I assume it's in the year 2019, it's a semi-automatic yes. pistol, correct? Yes. Um, and during the course of uh, both your training and your years of law enforcement, I'm sure you've had the opportunity to become familiar with the types of semi-automatic pistols that are in circulation in the world, right? I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I have general knowledge. Um, a, a Glock? Yes. A semi-automatic is, is a popular firearm, correct? Yes. It's a firearm that's uh, used um, throughout law enforcement, in fact. Yes. Um, you're familiar uh, that within your agency, a Glock semi-automatic pistol is a, a firearm that's used by deputies. Yes. And you're familiar that a Glock 23 is a 40 caliber Glock pistol. Yes. And that if you were to have a 40 caliber Glock 23 magazine, Yes. That that magazine would fit into any Glock 23 40 caliber firearm. Yes. Okay. Just one second, please. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, ma'am. Any redirect? Briefly, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. Detective Householder, you testified um, that you called there being a magazine that yeah. was in pocket. Yes. Yes. Okay. And this is the magazine that was taken out of his pocket. Correct? Yes. Okay. And are there bullets inside of the magazine? At least one that I can see, yes. Okay. Now, also depicted here is a glove in the photo, correct? Yes. Now, you told us that you went through, you went in his pockets to get, um, to verify his identity. Yes. Right? And you testified that his, his shorts were down. Yes. Not as a result of anything that you did. When he was taken by fire rescue, were there items that were still laying in the roadway? I believe so, yes. Okay. Well, you didn't pick up his shorts, did you? No. Okay. You only picked up, I guess, the ID, the bullet, well, the bullet and the, the magazine. Yes. Okay. And so these items were still laying in the street, meaning his shorts and the other clothing, art, article of clothing that were there. Yes. At any point, did you kind of rummage through those items or actually look through them to see what was actually there? I don't believe so, no. Okay. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? You may. No further questions. All right. You may step down. Watch your step. Thank you very much. State, call your next witness. State, call Dr. Juice. Dr. Juice, please.
hand, Dr. Juice, good afternoon. If you do me a favor, raise your right hand and face Mr. Clerk for me. All right, you're going to have a seat up there. Watch your step. The most important thing for this judge is that you grab that microphone, you speak into the center of it, and, uh, and tell us your full name and slowly spell it for the jurors. My full name is Gertrude Just. First name G as in George, E R T R U D E. Last name J U S T E. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, just as a reminder, uh, during this testimony, I believe you're gonna view some images of the decedent's deceased body and their injuries. Although it is proper for you to consider these images to the extent they are relevant to issues that are in dispute in this case, such images can trigger strong emotional reactions. Those emotional reactions, while perfectly normal, must not affect your decision-making process in determining whether the state has proved the crimes charged beyond and to the exclusion of any reasonable doubt. As such, I strongly caution you to be aware of your emotional, any emotional effect on you that these images may cause and urge you to take special care to ensure that such emotions do not improperly influence your decision making in the case. State, you ready? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Just. Good afternoon, Council. Where are you currently employed? I'm employed uh, by the Palm Beach Medical Examiner as an associate medical examiner. How long have you been with the office? Uh, since uh, July 2008. And prior to that? Uh, prior to that, I was uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. from 1996 to 2005. Uh, then I came to Florida in 2005 and worked for three years in Fort Lauderdale, Broward County for three years as an, as an associate medical examiner. Okay. And were you also a medical examiner in D.C.? Yes. Okay. And can you give the members of the jury a brief background of your education and training? Well, I uh, spent six years of medical school. Uh, graduated in 1980. Uh, then I did five years of training in the field of pathology. Actually, I work as a, as an, as a foreign medical graduate. I had to pass a, what they call an equivalency exam to qualify to train in the United States. So once you pass this exam and you, you become qualified to apply for training, which I did, and then I trained in New York for five years. Um, prior to this training, I worked at the University of Miami uh, for a couple of years uh, doing research pathology, and then I moved to New York and did five years of training in the field of pathology. From there, I went to D.C. and did a specialty training in the field of forensic pathology. I stayed in D.C. for the next nine years, I was offered a job after my training, so I stayed there and worked there until 2005. Uh, I was a deputy medical examiner and came here, applied for a job in Florida, uh, got a, a position in, in Broward uh, where I worked for three years. Then I was offered a job up here and I came here in 2008. And here you are? And here I am. Okay. Uh, in my training, uh, once you, you finish your training, then you you have to also pass what they call board med a examination. So uh, in order to qualify as a medical examiner or as a pathologist. Mm -hmm. What exactly do you do as a medical examiner? Well, a medical examiner is a doctor. You have to have a medical degree to be a medical examiner. Uh, once you finish medical school, then you train in the field of pathology like I did for four or five years. Uh, and once you finish that training, you have a choice of going into 
or the, you know, so what they call subspecialty, a specialty within the field. So forensic pathology is a specialty within the field of the general field of pathology. Uh, so I chose to go into forensic, which required an extra, an additional year of training. So um, a forensic pathologist essentially is a doctor who specializes in pathology and in the field of, in the subspecialty field of forensic pathology. And as such, we perform autopsies uh, as required by the law of the, you know, the um, governing the jurisdiction where you live or work. Uh, and uh, you perform autopsy uh, and certify causes and manners of death, you testify in court as to the facts and finding of your cases. Okay. Now, not every person that dies, their body is sent to the medical examiner's office, correct? No. Okay, and what's the distinction about between the bodies that do come to the medical examiner's office? Well, by law, we're required to examine anybody who died under suspicious circumstances. Uh, anybody young that died by unattended, you know, where the death is unattended by a, a physician, anybody in good health who died suddenly and unexpectedly, uh, because we, we, we also uh, perform the role of uh, 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 the job of serving for you know uh, for uh, cases that could be uh, potentially uh, of uh, public health risk. Uh, so if somebody dies suddenly and you know, unexpectedly, they are required by law to be examined by the medical examiner to determine what caused the death. Um, we also do any case that by violence, uh, cases by uh, poisoning. Uh, cases of uh, people in custody, uh, children, cases in, in, in infant death, you know, suddenly and unexpectedly, um, where uh, essentially uh, people go in penal institution and died under the custody, uh, under custody. So all these deaths are required to be examined by the medical examiner. Uh, if somebody dies and had been followed by a physician, and that person is known by that physician and they know that the disease had taken a course such that it would cause the person's death. There is no reason to refer that case to the medical examiner. The doctor, the physician has a uh, duty to sign your death certificate if he knows what you died for. Now you made mention of, as a medical examiner, determining the manner and cause of death. <laughs> what is the manner of death? The manner of death essentially is the circumstances surrounding a death. Um, we, as medical examiners, examine, do not do autopsies or examination in a vacuum. We have to know there has to be a history given to us as to where the body is found, what the circumstances of the death is, who found the body, where the body is found. And, you know, we have our own investigators also. The police is usually called to a death, the scene of death, but we may make the determination to send somebody from our office to go and examine the scene of the death and see what's going on. So um, the circumstances surrounding the death are going to die to uh, essentially determine uh, the manner of death. And what is the cause of death? What is that? Well, the cause of death is uh, any natural or unnatural uh, event that uh, uh, is going to uh, cause a chain of events leading to somebody not being able to sustain life. In other words, you can have somebody who start out having a natural disease, a disease process by which, you know, um, the person start deteriorating. The disease may, may go rapidly or may take years or, uh, you know, decades. But eventually, the disease has an effect on your body, your organs, such that at a certain point, you cannot sustain the physiology process of living. So you die from that disease. That's your cause of this. It's a natural process. So we call this disease, this, this process a natural process. So the cause of your death is a natural cause. Uh, we have other causes, causes where somebody dies, let's say, by violence. 
the, the process that starts the event is going to be what causes the person to die. Uh, somebody may have been close to their by natural disease, but if somebody, if that person is involved in a car accident, uh, there's a way of telling that where, how long the disease process would have taken. At that particular time, that's what killed the person. It's a violence or uh, a trauma that caused the person to die. Uh, so we have various causes of death. So um, the process that starts the chain of event leading to a person not sustaining life is the cause of the person's death. So there are various causes you can die. Uh, by violence such as gunshot wound, blood force trauma, um, stab wounds, those are trauma that cause you to die. Uh, in other words, they may, you may not die immediately from them, but even if you die three months down the road, but what started the process leading to your death is that event. So it will be that event as your cause of death. Okay. So when you are ultimately determining the manner and the cause of death. Is there a process you go through as part of the autopsy in making that determination when you examine the body? Yes, the body is usually examined. Like I said, we also usually obtain a history. Her body comes with a history such as, sometimes there's no history, of course, your body can be found and we have no idea who the person is and why the person was where they are, but we still know something that the person was found on the street, you know, uh, unknown, and we know it's a female or a male, so we go with what we have. So in an instance where it, you talked about the types of cases or when the bodies come to the medical examiner's office, and one of them was in a situation involving violence, right? Right. Okay, and I wanna talk specifically about the process that you would go through involving a situation of violence. Um, you said oftentimes, well, let me ask you this. Are there times when someone from the medical examiner's office will go out to a scene of a crime where there is a body? Most of the time, no, we would say 100% if there's a crime, we, we go to the scene. Somebody from the medical examiner's office will report to the scene. Unless the person has been transported, is not dead at the scene, it's transported to the hospital. Okay, but in an instance, a situation where the person is deceased at the scene, some representative from the medical examiner's office will go to that scene. Correct. And do they take photographs of the bodies and the positions they are at the scene? Yes. Now, once those bodies are removed from the scene and, the, and they are brought to the medical examiner's office, um, you as the doctor, are you made aware of the known circumstances surrounding that person's death? Usually we are uh, made uh, aware. Uh, before we even start the examination, we knew that, let's say somebody was on the street, uh, was beaten, was involved in an altercation, somebody had hit them with something, uh, and if the weapon is there, we are told what kind of weapon. So this is, all informa this is information that's usually provided. And, uh, and once we know uh, about the case, we proceed uh, uh, usually we have a standard, you know, we have standard procedure that we follow uh, depending on, on cases. Let's say if you, somebody's been shot, for example, we will be taking numerous x-rays of the body versus somebody who was in a car accident where we would not uh, uh, go to that process. We'll actually open the body and look at the injuries. Okay, so, Without. okay, so once the body makes it to the medical examiner's office, is there any set time period that the autopsy has to be done from the time the body arrives at the medical examiner's office? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. Okay. And are there multiple doctors that work at the medical examiner's office that perform autopsies? Correct. Cool. Okay. Now, once a body arrives and you are assigned to perform an autopsy, are there other individuals there that assist you in the process? Yes. We have a... Uh, um, to the autopsy technicians that uh, help us uh, many times. If the case is a criminal case, we usually, usually we have a police officer, a detective, a crime scene investigator that also exists, uh, uh, is there for the autopsy. Now, are there photographs that are taken of the body prior to you beginning the autopsy? Correct. The process involves uh, 
if a case is considered a, 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 a criminal case, usually the, there are precautions that we are required to take. At the scene, the body is put in a bag in front of the police officer and is sealed with a sealed number. That seal cannot be opened until the police comes and is a witness to us opening the body. There may be evidence that you don't want to lose and you don't want to compromise. So everybody is there when the body bag is actually, uh, the seal is broken. So seal is broken, the bag is open, photographs are immediately taken. Actually, photographs are taken of the bag with the seal unopened. And once it's open, then pictures are taken again of the body in the bag. And then the bag is, the body is removed from the bag, put on the gurney without the bag, and it's photographed again with the clothing and everything on it. So is it safe to say that from the time the body is brought in and the autopsy is about to be performed, there are photographs taken throughout the entire process? Yes. Okay. And when a body is taken out of a bag, and let's say we're talking about a, a situation uh, involving violence, and um, there are gunshot wounds to the body, do you do an overall assessment of the injuries that that person sustained? Oh yes, we normally take photographs uh, first, and then bodies on clothes. The clothes are taken separately and also photographed separately. If there are any defects on the clothes, they are photographed. If there is any evidence, still on the clothes, they are photographed and then, you know, are taken out, photographed separately, given to a crime scene investigator. So the clothes are taken and then uh, we document also, but not only by photograph, but by diagram and notes. So as the pictures are being taken, I have, um, you know, a diagram in my hand where I put where the evidence is found, for example, on the body, even though there is a photograph to it. So I, I document it also by notes and by diagrams. Okay. And when you are, you said you notated by, you take notes and you have a diagram as well. Yes. When you see the injuries on the body, are there any type of markings you put on each one of the injuries? or if it's a gunshot, uh, each one of the gunshot wounds on the body? Uh, normally, if we have one gunshot wound, we don't go to the process of marking it. We know it's a gunshot wound of entrance. If we have two, we know how to identify an entrance and an exit, we don't mark them. But once we start having multiple, we label them. We give them numbers or, or letters. So it's a way for us to uh, identify each of the injuries so that when we describe them in the, in a report, um, somebody can relate to what uh, you know we are saying and uh, see where uh, we are talking about uh, the positions of uh, the various injuries. Okay, and just going to positions um, when you're performing an autopsy, are you at any point, not in all cases, but are you ever able to make a determination as to um, how a person may have been positioned when they were shot? Normally we don't know how a person is positioned. If there are multiple gunshot wounds, uh, we might be able to say about one wound or another, uh, for example. So, uh, we might say, for example, if somebody is found, you know, on a certain, in a certain position on the ground or wherever that person is positioned and there is another gunshot wound uh, that, is, uh, that shows, you know, characteristics uh, that we can identify, um, we can probably say that, you know, this one is versus that one. Uh, was first and or second, you know, or this one came first or this one comes second, you know. But it's rare. Usually we just describe where they are and if you come up and you have any information that you want us to uh, corroborate, you might ask us whether it's consistent with that person being in that position because we are not witness to the event, you know what I'm saying? So although you can't say, you know, necessarily which, which gunshot wound might have come first. Are you able to make a determination sometimes as to whether an in, a wound is an entrance wound or an exit wound? 99% of the case, we, we are able to say that's what we trained for. We look at a gunshot wound and we are able to see which one is the entrance and which one is the exit. 
And when you're looking at gunshot wounds, are you always able to determine where the exit wound is? Not always. And why is that? Sometimes you, know, you may have multiple gunshot wounds, and uh, so you may be able to identify the entrances, but if you have multiple exits and the body, and, and uh, when you uh, try to track them, what we do usually if we have a gunshot wound, we try to, we see where the entrance is, and then when we open the body, we try to track from that entrance the track of the, the path of that bullet. So we are able to go from where it starts outside of the body, we track it inside of the body and see which organ that has been injured, you know, are affected by the that bullet uh, or weapon. And then we track it down to either a bullet, if the bullet didn't exit, or to another hole where the exit is. So we usually are able to do that. But there are times where somebody's shot so many times that the path converge into the tissues. So you would know where all the entrances are, but you cannot track from one to the other. So you do know where the exits are. So you are able to say that that person was, uh, all the entrances, was, this entrance is here, this entrance is there, and exits are over here. Entrances are here, or entrances are here, exits are here, or exits are here. So that's many times, if somebody is shot several times, it becomes really difficult to track a bullet from the point of entry to the point of exit. Okay. Dr. Joss, I want to talk to you specifically about a case involving um, a young man by the name of Sean Henry. Did you conduct an autopsy on Sean? Yes, I did. And I would like to approach you, and I'm going to show you some, some photographs. Um, if you could, when did you perform um, the autopsy? The autopsy was performed on February 8th, 2017 at 9-12. We started, that, we started it at 9-12. 9-12? In the morning. In the morning. Okay, and as you testified about um, how it is that a medical examiner is initially contacted and someone goes out to the scene, and you, prior to performing the autopsy, you get some information, basically a brief synopsis about what happened. Did you have information about this case uh, prior to performing the autopsy as to what was believed to have taken place? Yes. Okay. If you could take a look for me at these exhibits, this is State's Exhibit 208 through 222. If you could take a look at these for me, Dr. Judge. those photos? Yes. And are these photos a fair and accurate representation of taken during the autopsy of Sean Henry? Yes, they are. At this time, the state would offer into evidence state's exhibits 208 through 222. Any objection? Other than previously noted? And the same ruling, and I admit those. Okay. And now showing the witness state's exhibit 224 through 227. If you could take a look at these photographs for me, Dr. Judge. these photos yes okay and are these a fair and accurate photos a fair and accurate representation of the clothing that was photographed at the medical examiner's office that uh, Sean Henry was wearing when he came to the medical examiner's office yes 
At this time, the state would offer into evidence state exhibits 224 through 227. No objection. Admitted. Okay, Dr. Just, now there are, oh, wait, also this is a link of pointer. Mm -hmm. Put up some pictures, let me know if you can. Okay. See. Now, you said that there are photographs that are taken from um, the time the body is brought out for the autopsy um, through the entire process. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And after being photographed in their clothing, their clothing is photographed separate and apart. Correct. And is it always that the photos of the clothing, there are markers to indicate um, where there were holes in the clothing indicative of a gunshot. Yes. Okay. And this is states uh, 227. Okay. Okay. And here we have. Yes, sure. This, these are um, um, what they were put there by uh, the technician as he or she was taking the photographs. Okay. And Just to because many times, you know, it's not possible to see well where they are, the holes or the defects are, so they kind of pointed out on the photograph. And when you say defects, are you referring to where the, the article of clothing was punctured by the bullet or the bullet? Yes. Okay. And 225. And although the pants in this picture, is this a better view of what the marker is used to indicate yes. the defects in the pants? Yes. Okay. And at the bottom here, we have a number 17.0179. Is that the case number for the medical examiner's office? Yes. Okay. Now, once the, obviously these are the clothes that are photographed separately, um, and these are just a few of the pictures from the autopsy. Once the clothes are removed, um, are photos taken of the body with the medical examiner's number? Yes. Okay, and this is State Exhibit 208. And is this the photograph that was taken of Correct. Okay. Now, and I believe you talked about, I asked you about marking um, the injuries or wounds that a person sustains, and you testified that if it's one, there's really no need to mark um, with letters the different injuries necessarily. Correct. Right? Okay, in this, in this case, did you use letters to... I identify his wounds? I did. And why was that? Because there were multiple wounds. Okay. So it's a way for me to uh, identify each wound and describe him uh, specifically, each one of them. Okay. And do you try to mark them in alphabetical order to keep track of them? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to show you states 209. Um, in this case, I want to start, we'll start with uh, Sean's upper area. We'll start with his head. Uh, mm -hmm. Did Sean sustain any injuries to his head? Yes. He had two perforating gunshot wounds of the head, but four defects. Perf perforating gunshot wound is one where a bullet enters and comes out. It's making a wound of entry and a wound of exit. So it gives uh, one bullet would make two holes in the body. So, but it's only two bullets that went to his head. So made, making four holes, then each bullet came out. Okay, so I'm gonna put up 209, and we have marks here, A and B. So we 
have two injuries here, what is what appears to be on the right side of Sean's head, correct? Correct. Okay. And we'll start with A. Now, how is it, are you able to tell us whether this is an entrance or an exit wound? Uh, there are two different types of wounds here. One is an entrance, one is an exit. Okay. But they are not uh, associated with each other. Okay. And so, and just not to get at, not to get too ahead, um, on the other side, I just, I'll put it up just so we have a point of reference. Mm -hmm. This is 210. So on the other side, we have C&D, correct? Correct. Okay. And are you able to tell us which entrance wound goes with which exit wound? Uh, yes, give me one second. Okay. We have two gunshot wounds we call perforating. Uh, gunshot wound entrance that is labeled B from the other side of the head. B is an entry. You see, you can see that defect here. Okay, this is, a, this is the entrance wound. This is a very, it's a sharp, the margins are sharp. The second thing that I identified as a gunshot wound, and this is, you know, um, a characteristic for an entrance wound, is the dark um, black uh, deposit that you're looking on here, and also very various uh, pinpoint reddish, uh, uh, what we call steeple. They are essentially um, tiny tattoos that are made in the skin by burnt or burning powder, grains of powder as they come out of the gun. So. You said that's called what? Stippling. Stippling, okay. And what, do you always see stippling around a gun travel? No. And what, what is it that causes the stippling around the gun travel? Uh, the stippling, like, as I just said, is, uh, is a, a deposit, uh, not, not just a deposit. As a, 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 a weapon is fired, a gun is fired, uh, the, uh, the bullet is... Uh, Fired uh, the cartridge is, is fired. Uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with how the bullet, uh, you know, uh, a gun is fired. Anyway, there is a cartridge that holds the bullet, and under the bullet, you have powder. Uh, once you know, uh, you uh, have the, a pin that hits the back of the of that little cartridge and fired the powder the bullet is propelled out of the gun. As the, the gunpowder burns, it comes out of the gun behind the bullet. If the bullet, if the gun muzzle is close enough to the skin of that person being fired at, all this, the gases that already from the burnt uh, powder and the powder particles that are still burning at that particular instant the bullet comes out. They are all going to hit the skin. And what the tiny grains of powder that are still burning are going to do is that they're going to kind of burn the skin. And they are going to be like producing a little pattern of multiple, you know, pricks onto the skin that we identify as stippling. And the, the gunpowder that's already burnt also comes out of the gun and deposit around the wound just behind the bullet. As the bullet made the hole, you know, the, 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 um, the burnt powder will produce what we call soot, which is black deposit that goes onto the skin. So these two things you see in the gun are characteristic of a close range. Gunshot to it. Okay. And that was going to be my next question for you, Dr. Good. Is this something that you would see if someone was far away and fired the gun? 
Probably not. More likely that it was closer. It's a close gunshot wound, and also the the the, the dimension or diameter of the particles uh, are typical. Uh, depending on the diameter, you can more or less say whether uh, the gunshot wound was very close or uh, close, but not. Contact. You see so what I'm saying? You have different type of gunshot wounds. You have contact. A contact gunshot wound usually can be close contact, tight contact, where a gun is pressed against the skin so tightly that you don't have this. Because as the bullet comes out, both the particles that come out of the gun, the burnt powder, the burning powder, all of them are driven into the wound. So when you look at them, it's going to be very clean outside. But what you might see is the marking of the, of the gun um, barrel. That's what we call the muzzle imprint. So we know by seeing that, that the gun was close and pressed against the skin. But once the muzzle is no longer pressed against the person or the target, anything that comes out of it is going to deposit around the wound. But as the muzzle is being pulled away, you will see a larger pattern of deposit, and it will be more sparse. Okay. So for what you have marked as B, were you able to determine, um, you determined this is the entrance? Yes. And what was the exit? The exit on the other side of the, of the, of the head. The it's on the left side of the head. This is the exit over here. Okay. Cool. Okay, and what about, what about this, um, wound looking from the side? Do we know that this is the exit? Uh, I'm not seeing exactly what you are talking about. I mean, is there anything about this particular exit wound that lets you know that it is an exit wound versus an entrance? It's irregular. It's not the, remember I told you that the other wound was very, the other wound, had the characteristic of an exit is really 100% because you have suit and stippling. But also the characteristic is that it surrounded the um, a hole or defect that is sharp, where the margin are sharp and uh, sharp cut out. And over here you have quite ragged and irregular margins. Okay. So here in this photograph we have C. Good. Okay. And over here is C. And is C an entrance or an exit wound? It's another entrance. Okay. And do we know that because of what we see here on the outside surrounding it? Yes. I think you may have another picture that shows this better. Like close. Uh, I can zoom in on this one. This one. Okay. 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 So we have. Yeah, it's again a pretty sharp uh, defect, and you also can see all these little tiny reddish burn around it that we call steepling. So this one is pretty um, close too. And you were able to determine that C, the exit wound was. Yeah, this bullet that started on the left side of the skull came out right here, anterior to the earlobe, right earlobe. Now, are you, in, in these two that we just shown, you were able to determine the entrance wound and the exit wound. Um, are you essentially tracking it through, in this particular, in, in this part of his body, in, through his head? Yes. Okay, and are you always able to track it from the entrance to exit? Not always, because those two bullets they essentially lacerated the brain, but it's pretty easy in those two uh, uh, instances because um, entrance wounds are 
very clear. There is no ambiguity which is entrance and there is no ambiguity which is exit. So once you, uh, we, we use a pole, but then we put it through the entrance on the right and run through the entrance on the right and connected it to the exit right and left. So it was easy to actually determine the path on those two. Okay. Now when you are making note of your findings, did you measure? Yes. Okay, what's the purpose of measuring the, the wound? Oh, well, it's a standard procedure that we do because uh, many people believe that uh, you can tell the caliber of a weapon by the size of the wound, but actually they do not correlate. Bullets, bullet wounds can be uh, larger than actual projectile or smaller than the actual projectile. Because you, you, yeah, unless you know it goes through the bone, it's more consistent because it's a very fixed structure. But the skin is an elastic structure, and uh, soft tissues, when bullet pass through it, it may easily make a hole that uh, was wide as the bullet made it, and then the skin can retract easily and make it look smaller. Okay. Were either of these? headshots that Sean sustained fatal? They are both fatal. Okay. Um, could he have still been conscious um, with one or the other, like depending on what order they came in? Like would he have still been conscious or would he just immediately been unconscious as soon as the bullet hit or would he still been able to breathe? I described the path of the first the, of the gunshot wound that started uh, the, uh, behind the right ear. I des described the track as passing to the right mastoid process, which is the bone behind your ear. And it entered the skull, traveled to the right next to uh, a hole into your spine, your, where your head is attached to your spine. So that hole at the base of your skull, it bullet passed close to it. What's that what's there? It's your vital Go ahead. It's the <laughs> it's the vital uh, center of your brain. So it did pass to the vital center of the brain and then life is really pretty much cut short pretty fast. Okay. And again you're unable to say which one of the injuries gunshot wounds came first? In the head? Right. Uh, the second bullet wound, uh, the, the other one, well, I don't, I, I'm just, I'm, the second I described, CNA, the entrance was uh, on the back of the head, and it, the bullet went to the back of the head, and then continue into the, us, what we call the small brain. We have the main two uh, hemisphere, and at the bottom we have what we call the cerebellum. And so the bullet hit right into that inferior part of the brain and went through the same area that the first went to. In other words, this, these two bullets are both hit a vital center that would have killed them instantly. On to um, other gunshot wounds that Sean sustained. Um, so I know they they're all labeled with alphabets, but I want to talk about um, we did A through D and what is marked as E. Are you, were you able to determine where, what the entrance wound was that created the defect at E? I uh, describe E 
as having made by, uh, as being on the track of a bullet wound that started on the right uh, um, upper arm close to the shoulder. And that bullet is labeled K. Okay, and that's- That bullet wound is labeled K on the right shoulder. It started on the right shoulder and traveled under the skin all the way to the left side of the chest next to the next to the left collarbone and that's where the bullet is found but it travels so superficially that it tear the skin uh in where you see the letter e okay, you so we kind of label at the top of the photograph. Correct. And is this where you're saying the entrance wound is? Yes. Okay, so K is an entrance wound. Correct. And, and this one, do we have any stippling or soot? No. Okay, and that's indicative of maybe not being as close as the one we saw to the head. Yes, but he also has clothing. Close. Clothing will keep uh, soot or stippling from showing on the skin. Okay, because of the clothing he was wearing. Correct. Okay. And so K traveled across the chest, correct? Correct. Okay, and we know K's entrance wound was a result of what we see here in E, F, and G. No, F and G are separate. I'm sorry, e. e. We have a bullet that's under the skin, right after E, under the skin. In the photograph, it's on the right, I'm so sorry. Oh. Okay, in the photograph you have E, but E is barely an exit because the bullet travel under the skin. And as a bullet is traveling into the body, what it does is essentially tear up the tissues and create a, and create a, a space. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the energy that the bullet release is going to separate the tissues. And in doing so, the bullet was so close to the skin that it created that, that uh, defect. But it is found very closely when I, when I cut the skin, I followed the track from the right shoulder. You can see how it's going, hemorrhage is going from here all the way here and the bullet ended up next to this under the skin. Okay. This over here, E and F are. Oh, F and G? F and G, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. well, I want to stop you just before we get to F and G. You said the, the bullet that the entrance was K and the bullet that the entrance was K and we have here where it came close, well, came to the skin, and E, you said it lodged in the chest. Correct. It, it lodged uh, somewhere around here. Now, during the course of the autopsy, do you actually um, go inside to look at the injuries that was that were caused internally? Yes. Okay. And in your doing that, do you also remove uh, any type of bullets or fragments or projectiles that you find once you look internally? Yes. Okay. And so, and we'll get to it, but because you're talking about it now, the bullet that was lodged under his skin, did you remove that? Yes. Okay. And are those items collected and packaged up and sent to be a part of the case. Yes. Okay. So now moving on to F and G. Yes. Were you able to make a determination as to an entrance and an exit wound? Yes. The entrance is the small hole that you're looking at. That's label G. And when we, and this is another hole that we connected to this hole here. It's superficial under the skin. It didn't enter the body. Uh, the cavities of the body. It went like almost parallel to the skin, but went under the skin and came out in here. So this is connected to this. And when we opened the body, we made an incision that goes like, a, we call it a Y incision, started here from the left shoulder to the middle, and then we open it out and we flip the skin on both sides of the body. So we are able to see the track where it started, this, this is a typical entrance, and this is a typical exit. And under the skin, we know that that bullet went here and came out here. But under the skin, there were a few little fragments okay. still left. 
What is the pinpoint reddish abrasion indicative of? What are we talking Under F? Under F here? Yes. That's what we call a contusion. The bullet, I am not sure, you know, what, what was under his body or where his body was at that point. So uh, on exiting, it looks like a bullet where I'll come off against the skin. I want to show you 212. So the defendant was turned in. Yeah. What were your findings as to age, Dr. Judge? Age is a typical entrance gunshot wound. We, we have a hole we, right here, <laughs> and the margin that you see that looks a little darker, we call it the marginal abrasion. Marginal abrasion is by, done by the bullet as the bullet is entering the body, and it kind of rub off under the skin as it penetrates, set to enter. So we, got, we have that abrasion surrounding the wound. This bullet is, was went into the body uh, and went through. So following this bullet from the skin, opening the body and, and seeing where it's going. I was able to see that first, it started under the skin and then uh, went between uh, the fifth and the sixth ribs on the left side. Uh, then it went through the heart and then it continued toward the right side, from the left side toward the right side, and it hit the right lung. But I wasn't able to see where exactly it exited because there were other injuries that started on the left side of the body that had created a lot of injuries on, in the organs, the same organs that this bullet hit. Those organs were also hit from the right side. So at that point, you cannot tell how it continues through the body. Okay. Like we were able to tell about the gunshot wounds to the head and K Correct. to E and F and G. Correct. Okay. Was this, was this a fatal wound or could have been a fatal wound? Yes, it went to the heart and the lungs. That's a fatal wound. Okay. I want to move on to, to I. Gunshot wound I. And this is Uh, this one is on the uh, on the left arm. On the left arm, is it on the inside of his arm? Well, actually, give a better visual. Okay. Yeah, this bullet this bullet one enters the left uh, lower arm, the ne next to the elbow. Okay. So you're looking at it uh, closer. And what is it that we have around the entrance? We have more abrasions up and down this wound, which indicate that the arm may have been slightly folded at the time. And uh, that's why, you know, the bullet made those two uh, scraping as it enters. But we know for sure that it's an entrance, it's a little wide. Sometimes we call it an entrance gunshot wound, a typical gunshot wound. Uh, because of the characteristic, because we normally would see a sharp injury without all these things around it. But following the bullet into the body, we were able to follow the track all the way to the actual bullet that penetrated the body. So there is no doubt about the, you know, the uh, 
this being an intense gunshot wound. And was that also a bullet that you collected from the body Correct. and packaged it? Correct. Okay. With this, compared to the other wounds, was this more superficial than some of the other gunshot wounds that we've seen so far? Yes. Like to the head? Yes. Uh, another, another thing about bullets that make these type of things also, it, it is uh, uh, sometimes the bullets have uh, low velocity because they have hit something else before they hit the person, so they don't have enough uh, energy left to travel far. So at the time it hit the body and it really actually ended up pretty close to, and the arm being the arm, a bullet normally traveled through and through. And this bullet wasn't able to go that far. So I, I uh, what I think is that that bullet was already uh, losing velocity when it entered the body. Okay. So we're moving on to Jay. Yeah. This one is a superficial wound. It didn't go through and through the finger, but what you can see is that it skip over uh, the third finger right here. I think it's the second year. And would this be considered superficial? Yeah, because it, it essentially cut through the top of the finger. Okay. It just passed through, and as it passes, it hit one finger, and you know, um, very superficially uh, pass on top of the other. Okay. I want to show you, kind of jumping around a little bit. Um, going back to K, even though we talked about uh, K with E. But here we have K, L, and M. And you told us that K was the entrance wound and the exit wound where it came up to the skin was E and then it, mm -hmm. it lodged. We talked about that. So next we have um, L and M. What were your um, observations of these two wounds? Okay, L is an entrance entrance wound. It started here, and M is another entrance wound. So you have a line, one wound that entrance, two and three entrances. Pretty much a line along the right side of the arm. Um, I followed the track to this. K was traveling toward the... That was E, right? K was traveling from here along the uh, anterior chest below the clavicle or collarbone. And then that's what made the hole that we had labeled E under the skin. But the bullet was found on the left side of the chest. This one went through and through, L and M, they both went through and through. So... When you say through and through, what do you... That mean? means there are other holes in the arm on the other side. You'll see we have other pictures okay. that I connected those wounds to. Okay. And that's L and M, and then... N and O, 218. Okay. So clear, this is the right side of Sean's body, correct? Yes. Okay. And here in this photograph, we see that the this is his hand down here. The arm is turned back. Mm -hmm. um, the bicep appears to be rather large. Correct. Um, was there anything that happened to his bone um, as a result of that? Yeah, it was broken by the bullet. So now we have N, we see N, O, and P here. Correct. Okay, and were you able to track either L and M to any of these uh, gunshot wounds? Uh, M, bullet wound that we look at uh, on the other side, I tracked to N. Okay, and 
Were you able to track L? Yeah, I believe I was, so. I have to look, look it up. <laughs> there were too many gunshot wounds to remember. Okay, we, oh, may I have just a second, Your Honor? Pardon? Just pause for a second. Okay. Okay. Were you able to, you said you were able to track, was that M and N? Yeah, there is another gunshot wound that I did, you did not show in the picture because O is connected to a gunshot wound label V, which is on, on another side of the okay, arm. So, so v. this arm was really pretty much hit a lot several times. Correct. That's V over here. Okay. And was V an entrance or an exit wound? It's an entrance wound. This is V and the wound we were looking at before in the other picture that was at the bottom was connected to this gunshot wound V. Back on the other one. I'm sorry, I cannot see very well here. So V is a typical entrance, and the one that was more, uh, and this is O. So this bullet started here and exited here. Okay, and O looks different than some of the other exit wounds that we have seen. Is there anything, does this exit wound say, tell you anything? Yeah, it tells me that the bullet travel at a very, uh, at a very shallow angle as it exited. The sort, in such a way that it kind of tears the tissue as it comes out okay. Uh, okay. diagonally. Okay, and we also have is it P. How would you characterize um, this injury? Oh, this is what we call a graze wound. This gunshot wound did not penetrate, it, it cut, essentially cut the skin. It went over the skin, uh, it grazed the skin. And that, uh, you know, it, as it passes over the skin, it's almost parallel to the surface of the skin. Such gunshot wounds will cut the top of the skin, but because they are coming at that angle, that almost a parallel, you know, or they come almost parallel to the skin, they don't penetrate the skin. They kind of skip over the skin and remove the top layer of it. And we call it a graze. That's what the bullet does. Oops. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, moving on to, we have a one photograph, Q, R, S, and T. Are these also on the...
Are these also to the right side of Sean's body? Yes. Okay. And we'll start with Q, which is above, yeah, above R. Q is an insurance one. Well, Q is? That's the one here, right? Okay. That is an entrance wound. This is an entrance wound. Let me. That's fine. So when you come down, just here, I'll probably speak louder for you. And then we have I'm just gonna put this over there by you. No, 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 you stay over here. You stay here by the microphone. I describe as an entrance wound of the right axilla. And Doc, can you do me a favor and get right next to that microphone? Okay, you describe Q as an entrance wound. Correct. Were you able to track the bullet as it entered the body? Yes. Uh, the bullet went through the skin, went through the muscle of the right side of the chest, entered the, chest, the right side of the chest under the sternum or chest plate. So it started here, cut to the muscle, entered the body under the, you know, the, the chest plate. And... Uh, was there an exit wound or was the bullet or fragments of it? It's, it's a penetrating gunshot wound. There was a bullet uh, recovered from the left side of the chest, from this bullet wound. Another way of being sure that you have an entrance gunshot wound, like I said, you can see that there are abrasions, but we have uh, bullets entering the body with an arm possibly in the way, or other uh, things uh, of clothing or there are so many uh, wounds together, you don't know what else is flying at the time. But we are able to follow this for, because we open the skin and we look at the track and it's going to be a definite track that starts from the wound leading to the bullet. And you can see where the track starts and you, were, you see where it finished, where the bullet is and the hemorrhage stops there too. So we can easily track the bullet from where it started to where, you know, how the track ends and determine the trajectory of that bullet. Okay. Moving on to R. Were you able to determine whether this was an entrance or an exit wound? Um, I was not uh, very sure about gunshot wound R. But I believe, like I said, it's a most probably an exit gunshot wound connected to the wound on the left, on the left side. Each gunshot wound that I could not essentially follow, continue following the track. The one that started on this side of the body, I had tracked it to the heart and the lung on the right side. But the right side of the body has so much injury that I couldn't tell exactly, but I believe that this bullet is probably the one that exited here. Okay. And moving on to S. Where are you to S? Uh, S, I call it an atypical gunshot wound of right chest. It's pretty, it's much larger than what you expect from a gunshot wound of entrance, however, Many times you're going to have an entrance gunshot with, when the bullet is traveling not straight but sideways, or if the bullet has hit something before hitting the body. So in those cases, you don't have what is called a typical entrance because the bullet is tumbling. 
So it will enter the body at a different angle or from sideways, and it will cause a much larger wound. So I call this one an atypical entry wound. And what was the track of this? Uh... So I followed this track from that left side of the body through um, a fracture of the right left, I'm sorry, right uh, ninth rib. And then the track continued to the diaphragm and the liver and went straight into the spine of uh, Mr. Sean Henry. Um, so that bullet went into the spine, actually did not lodge into the spine because the spine, you know, uh, the way the, the bones are, are made, they are kind of uh, compact in the front with a, a curved surface. So it essentially went through that curved surface and went to the left side of the body. It continues and um, lacerated the spleen of Mr. Sean Henry and the left side of his diaphragm. So a deformed bullet is also recovered at the end of that track. And that's how you know uh, definitely that you have the entrance coming from here when you are able to track a, a hemorrhage, uh, a laceration that starts here and continue into a track all the way to a bullet. Okay. And we have T, which is uh, the lower part of the photo. Yeah, that's, what, yeah. What this one is more a of a typical entrance. You can see the bullet entered head on. Uh, you able to this the bullet went to uh, in, inside went inside of the body. You see, it's very lateral. You're looking at the anterior part of the body, the middle. Uh, you know um, what you call uh, your uh, lateral torso, and you already get into uh, the posterior side of the body. So from there, this bullet went straight for the 11th uh, rib, which is really low, because your chest uh, has those ribs going that way and that way. So the 11th rib uh, is the last really big rib in the body, and it curved and, and uh, essentially mixed, <laughs> what about what I'm saying? It converges, you know, more or less with the other uh, ribs uh, anteriorly. So the, the 11th rib was broken, and under the 11th rib is the diaphragm, so the bullet went through the diaphragm, then went again to the lobe, right lobe of the liver. So the liver is hit more than once. The right kidney was also hit, and the colon, because this is pretty low, and your abdomen is already there, so it took the large bowel, and then it lodged into a muscle that is very close to the back. So there was no exit? No. Okay, was that? And the bullet was also recovered there. Okay. And moving on to gunshot wound view. Was this also an uh, entrance gunshot wound? Yeah, this one was on the right hip region. Right hip. Yes. Okay. Again, again, a very sharp out margin. What you're seeing here is tissue from the inside that's spilling out. And For you, were you able to determine um, uh, this gunshot wound went through the muscle of the right uh, buttock, exited the left buttock into another one that we label Y. Okay, and just to jump ahead of W and X, yeah. you said Y was the exit wound Correct. on the bottom left in the photo. Yeah, so it started on the right side, you're not able to see it from this photograph, the entrance. But the exit is here. So we have the entrance here. Correct. And we have the exit here. Correct. Okay. And then we have W. Wait, we already did V, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so we have W and we have X. Correct. Which are, this is his back? This is his back. We have a bullet that started here. Keep under the skin, you can see how the hemorrhage of the redness, you see, is because the bullet is passing under the skin and causing a hemorrhage. So you are able to see it here. Although it's keep here because as it 
it's more superficial here and it continues more under the muscles here. That's why, you know, you can see the redness here and less redness here, but then it came out here. And the exit, the exit? Yes, uh, it exited the, the left side of the back. And I just want to briefly, Dr. Jess, talk about, uh, you talked about bullets lodging in the body. Um, this is 222. Um, is this a bullet that is, that was recovered from Sean's body that actually was lodged in his body? Yes. Okay. You can have a seat. Now, you talked earlier about manner and cause of death, yes. as it pertains to the autopsy performed on, performed on Sean Henry, um, what was the manner of death? Uh, it's a homicide. And what did you determine the cause of death to be? Uh, multiple gunshot wounds. <coughs> Are there x-rays that are also done? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 252 through 259. You can take a look at these for me. Dr. Just, are these a fair and accurate representation of x-rays that were taken of Sean Henry yes. during the course of the autopsy? Yes, they are. At this time, the state would offer into evidence state's exhibits 252 through 259. Admitted. 252, 259. I think so. And I am now showing Dr. Just 228 through 251. Do you recognize these photos as well? Yes, I do. Let's see. Yes, we do. We do. Yes. Okay. And. And states exhibit 221 through. Two, I'm sorry, 228 through 251. Are these a fair and accurate representation of bullets and or projectiles that were recovered from Sean Henry's body during the course of the autopsy? Yes, they are. At this time, the state offers into evidence state's exhibit 228, I believe it is. Yes. Through 251. 
Yes. So you walk them over. I'm going to All right, no problem. And while you're doing that, I think my jury needs a break. You guys are going at it. I think I'm going to let you go out, get out of that room too. All right. Uh, when you come back in from your break and you want to make a pit stop in there and grab something, that's fine as well. So why don't we take about uh, 10 minutes, maybe a little longer, and you can run to the coffee shop if they got something that you want that I didn't give you. And so uh, put your pads upside down in your chairs, don't talk about the case, and I'll see you back in about 10 to 15 minutes, somewhere in there. Watch your step, bless you, and take them all the way out, deputies.